where two brothers embark on a thrilling journey through the realms of scientific inquiry, the enigmatic mysteries of the past, and the uncharted territories of spirituality. Join us as we explore the wonders of our world and beyond, all while embracing the roles of curious bystanders rather than experts. Together, we'll unravel the intricate tapestry of existence, blending the dichotomies of knowledge and wonder, getting ready to question ponder and delve into the dualities that shape our understanding of reality on duality check i'm drew and i'm dean and today uh this is an exciting episode it's going to be the first of many of uh shows where we talk about ufos which is one of my favorite it's one of our favorites topics. yeah we go on i mean i think i'm late getting home most nights when we're hanging out because we're talking about UFOs. <laughs> yeah. We're always sending each other, you know, little YouTube videos or articles or yeah. podcasts about it. Constantly keeping each other updated on anything that we're both interested in. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of the big ones that we talk about a lot. So totally. But this, uh, this will probably be kind of a broad stroke. Just, just get a, get a look into our minds on this topic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We just kind of want to, Discuss the topic from an overview standpoint. Where do we sit on it? Um, what are the different perspectives? Um, and then from there, you know, future episodes can talk about, you know, specific cases or specific books on the matter or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we hope to, you know, get people to send us in over time, you know, send us in some stories, something that we might have not talked about or, just uh, anything that might, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Just anything that might uh, intrigue you and yeah. uh, something you want to show us. Yeah. yeah, get involved. Yeah, send us some stuff. Yeah. Uh, we've actually been doing a pretty poor job of letting you guys know how you can get in touch with us. That's true. We, we were just talking about the last that. episode. We literally told zero about. Yeah. People are like, oh, and uh, we're, I mean, I guess it's kind of weird, though, because it's like if you're listening to it, you know where to find us. I mean, on your podcast player, but <laughs> we have a website. Yep, we do. Which is dualitycheck.net. .net. It's becoming uh, more popular. We've got popular. Facebook, .net. Twitter. Um, TikTok, but TikTok. you probably won't see us on there much. It's more of the... You know, yeah, we'll you, post some you, clips. You might, yeah, yeah, we're we're still some. new. I don't do a lot of social media in my personal life, so it's going to be a growing experience to like yep, integrate some of us. social media for the show. But it'll be fun doing it all together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, TikTok, a Rumble, we're going to post. I think you said that. Mm, I don't think I did, but yes. But yeah, we'll Spotify, be anywhere you can find your podcasts. Yep. Also, you can email us. Yep. If you would like to give us feedback about the show, if you would like to ask questions, just send a note, give a yep. recommendation. You yeah. can email us at hosts at dualitycheck.net. Yep. H O S T S at dualitycheck.net. Yep. So today, um, before we get into the UFO topic, I did want to do a little bit of a follow up on yesterday, well, last week's episode. Yesteryear. Yesteryear's episode <laughs> um, about the Younger Dryas. Because mm -hmm. um, there was one point where we were talking about the Torrid Meteor Stream and we weren't exactly about sure about like the state of studying current, it current like how much they've mapped and stuff right, right. that we did we kind of covered it a little bit in the, at the end of the podcast but um yeah so i found an interesting article about it and this i think i actually would like to find out more about it but uh i wanted to share this it's a pretty short article and uh yeah let's get into it this is on fizz.org uh, titled P H Y S dot org. Yep. Not fizz, like F I Z Z. <laughs> right. Not like fizzy soda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, study investigates potential risk of torrid meteor swarm by Jeff Reynaud, University of Western Ontario. All right. A new study from Western University posits proof to the possibility that an oncoming swarm of meteors likened to the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot by some extraterrestrial experts may indeed pose an existential risk for Earth and its inhabitants. That's us. I'm it's considering weird. sorry. It's what? weird that they that just off the top, it's weird that they likened an oncoming swarm of meteors to the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot. Yeah. Uh, this sounds like science journalists saying uh, a bunch of people who are into UFOs and Graham Hancock, ancient alien stuff are talking about this meteor stream. Okay. <laughs> They're clearly making something bigger out of it than it is. Just like that old Bigfoot story where, you, you know, you guys remember that? It's such a yeah. hoax. Okay. <laughs> so they're like, Keep yeah, going. even though these weirdos talk about this thing on all the time, it may indeed pose an existential risk. <laughs> <laughs> so when considering catalysts for catastrophic collision, there are two main sources, near-Earth objects like asteroids and meteoroids and interlopers from the outer solar system, which are typically comets. Over the past few decades, a great deal of effort has been expended in cataloging more than 90% of the potentially hazardous near-Earth objects, and work is ongoing to detect, catalog, and track greater numbers and smaller sizes of these objects. Interlopers <clears throat> from the outer solar system are much harder to chart, but again, work is underway. So, yeah. <clears throat> so near-Earth objects, yeah. I think it's essentially trying to distinguish things that are essentially have like an earth like orbit around the sun. Right. So like they share a kind of a similar orbit to us and they may cross our orbit at certain times, which makes them potentially hazardous. So there's a lot of those that have been mapped, but not as much work has been done on the outer solar system. Yeah. Object, like the Oort cloud objects that can get kicked into the inner solar system. And those are the ones that you, science, would likely not see coming. They're harder to see investigators until they get close enough to the sun that they, like, light up and have these big tails, right? Because they're sitting so far oh, out yeah. that they're these icy comets. Right. That and then when they come right. in and get close enough to the sun, the sun mm -hmm. will start causing Burn them to outgas. Um, anyway. The torrid swarm is a third potential source of risk that changes the probabilities of possible catastrophic impacts. The Tunguska, Russia explosion of 1908 is considered a one in 1,000 year event, assuming a random distribution of events over time. But the torrid swarm, a dense cluster within the torrid meteor stream and through which Earth periodically passes, changes the odds significantly and gives a possible reason for the unlikely occurrence that a once per thousand year event occurred just over a century ago. If the hypoth if the hypothesized might of the torrid swarm is successfully proven, this also heightens the possibility of a cluster of large impacts over a short period of time. Based on the timing of, of the thousand year recurrence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it says that we cross it periodically, but we cross it twice a year. So, yeah, that's periodically. That's very periodic. But, yeah, but that might it's be... It's not always the densest part of the swarm. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, it's it. not necessarily always the densest part. But anytime you go out in, you but know, October, November... Does it always change meteors, which part? Sorry, does it always change which part of the cluster that we hit? Or is it pretty regular? Maybe it'll explain it more in here, but I don't know. So, that would this be includes a little to, YouTube to video, out. and we'll... Link I mean, to that for the podcast, but it's watch thirty those seconds. Let's watch yeah, it. Yeah, it's watch it's it. just a little animation showing. So we've got uh, objects orbiting, and we see Earth crossing the orbit of those objects. Yeah. Jeez. And then, as those Earth crosses through those objects, it kind of color codes the objects based on, I think, distance from Earth or likelihood of hitting. Yeah, what does that exactly chart know say? What that M stands for. I don't, it just says meters from it. I doubt it. It could be meters, distance, but well, meter. I don't know miles. 
miles maybe yeah from it like how far it was away from earth at the time right as it passed by it yeah we'll link all this stuff but it's interesting because it looks like a little rainbow and they're all color coded sections of the yeah. of the this swarm is an animation show created by something that we can western university i bet you it'll describe it maybe uh for the study published by arxiv a-r-x-i-v and accepted for publication in monthly notices of the Royal Astronom Astronomical Society, David Clark from Western's Department of Earth Sciences and Paul Wiegert and <laughs> Peter Brown. <laughs> Is that <laughs> Wiegert? Wiegert. You said Wiegert. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter Brown from Western's Department of Physics and Astronomy simulated a large collection of 100 meter diameter meteoroids like the one that triggered the 1908 Tunguska event with orbits similar to the Torrid Swarm and calculated their positions forward for a thousand years. By analyzing each object's position and motion over time, the astronomers calculated two optimal viewing times and telescope pointing locations for the Torrid Swarm to properly investigate its overall risk potential. Gotcha. So they are studying this shit. Yeah. But it is, Clearly. that was just a, it, simulation so you, is that the entire uh that's is that just the, a dense part of it or is that the entire toward media stream that is a simulation of just the densest parts of it or what no so it says a large collection of 100 meter diameter meteoroids like the one that triggered so i think what they're doing is they're essentially taking like a known date and time of when we crossed the debris mm -hmm. that caused the 1908 event, throwing a bunch of objects there at that time and then simulating it forward. Okay. Okay. It does, that, I don't get the impression that that was like an actual scan of the meteor okay. stream itself. Right. Well, yeah, because, I mean, the last time we passed it, well, I guess we passed it twice passed a year, twice but... A year. Yeah, but the last... Well, there was the one in... Uh, Chelyabinsk. Chelyabinsk, yeah. Uh, for the, in Russia, the one like you can see videos where people have dash cam videos and stuff of it coming oh, yeah, in, yeah, and exploding. It, yeah, and it, it just blew out like people's super, windows for like, it was like a 10, 20 mile radius from where it exploded. It didn't do any like other than, you know, blowing, blowing out, out windows. windows. Some people like got glass in their eyes who were standing sure, in, in sure, their windows. Of course. Never stand next so to there a was window injuries, during an explosion. But, That's crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, okay. So, but like physically it didn't like topple buildings and like, because right. it was high enough in the atmosphere. Well, it was, yeah, it was high, but it was small. Like something high in the atmosphere, if it's bigger and it explodes, can create a bigger impact. Right. And the impact would be on the atmosphere itself. And it's like not, if it was a like we sized about, object yeah, like that we exploded in Chelyabinsk, like yeah. it would have flattened that city. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that checks out. Um, according to Western Meteor Physics Group data analysis, the Earth will approach within 30 million kilometers of the center of the Torrid meteor swarm this summer. This is in 2019. The closest such encounter since 1975. The calculations also show that this will be the best viewing time of the Torrid swarm until the early 2030s. 2030s, that's only seven years away. Mm. Eight, nine, if you're talking about early, thir eight, early 30s. Yeah. God. There's been great interest in the space community since we shared our results at the recent Planetary Defense Conference in Washington, D.C., says David Clark, a Western graduate student and first author of the study, there's strong meteoric and NEO evidence supporting the Torrid Swarm and its potential risks, but this summer brings a unique opportunity to observe and quantify these objects. That was the name of the. That was the name of the study, right? The NEO evidence. Well, the Western graduate student and his yeah, first yeah, author yeah, of yeah. the study, and that was the name of the. That was like a quote from the study, or is that a quote from him? Oh, yeah, that's what That's a said. quote from David gotcha. Clark, gotcha, gotcha, who gotcha, was gotcha, the author gotcha. of the study. Okay. So. Is that it? Hopefully, the, yeah, that's it. It's short. Okay. Um, there's got to be something more updated because this was just essentially predicting that in 2019 was going to be an optimum viewing time. So there's got to be stuff since then about what data was collected in 2019. That's so I'll do a little this. more searching. Yeah, that's the beauty of this. We'll just keep going and keep, keep, 
Keep talking. But maybe I'm it. wrong. Maybe this is like at least a rough scan of. I was going to say because if this is if it's got to be a. I mean, we have plenty of stuff that could scan that as it passed by, right? Mm-hmm. Like you would think. Well, yeah. I mean, there's the all the amateur astronomers around the world. Yeah. If as long as they know what to. Well, point we also have stuff in space at. too. We have stuff in space. Yeah. We've, we've, we have to have be able to been able to scan it or at least take a photo of it. Yeah. The problem with the Torrids is like. It's massive. They, the part of the sky that they come out of makes it so that they're like backlit by the sun sometimes. Um, so it can be hard to. Yeah. To photograph them. But you can still get, you know, different types of imagery off of them. Yeah. Instead of visual light. Anyway, that's a interesting that. yeah. little bit. So they are study, studying it, and they have a decent idea of what it looks like and what the yeah. And this information like. was presented at a planetary defense conference, so in Washington D.C. Yeah. So at least there are some people really keeping an eye on it. Cool. Which is hopeful. Definitely. And we'll keep talking about it as more and more come out. Yeah, it's a it's a crazy thing. What did I do? Your mic is coming in really low. It's coming in real low. Yeah, can you kick your level up one? Is that any better? Well, that's much yeah. better. <laughs> okay. All right. They don't want to hear me. <laughs> Let's talk about UFOs. Let's get into some UFOs. Where, do you want? You got something you want to show me? Um, I've got some stuff to read. I've got some topics to talk about. Um, but I really think we should mostly have a free forum conversation. Yeah. Um, the, I was ready for that cause I didn't bring anything. <laughs> 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 I know I've got some thoughts here and some things I want to talk about. Yeah. So what do we think about UFOs? <sighs> What's your take? R- my rough take UFOs specifically. I think they are something that we're physically seeing, right? They're not some uh, psychological trick of the mind. Mm-hmm. or I mean, and if they are, it's the same as seeing. Mm, yeah, because it's still something people are experiencing. Yeah, it's an experienced thing, whether it be something that somebody else can validate or not. Um, yeah. But, yeah, no, just generally on UFO specifically, I mean, I think we're seeing something. There's no way that this has gone on. Um, and UFOs is a loose term for me, too. Like, I don't think about it as, like, it has to be a saucer, it has to be this, or it has to be that. I mean, it could be an orb or, you know. Yeah. It's an unidentified flying, unidentified flying object, so. Right. The new term UAP. UAPs is what they talk about now. Yeah. Unidentified. Unident- oh, is it? Unidentified. Anomaly. Is it not? Unidentified anomalous there was, phenomena. Yeah. Aerial phenomena. Is mm, what they aerial phenomena. Uh, w- well, no, I think they, there's also like U, UAP meaning unidentified or, yeah, unidentified I think it's anomalous aerial. phenomena. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a little more open, open, ca- open umbrella. Well, and the fact that they changed the term, like the government's been saying UFOs just as long as the public has been saying UFOs, right? Right. right. So it the, was the, flying saucer. Yeah. Then it's UFOs. Yeah. Now it's yeah. it UAPs. But it, it, I mean, maybe there's something to read into it as far as them changing it to UAPs. Mm-hmm. As far as like unidentified aerial phenomena like they're admitting it's a phenomena in the air and it's unidentified well but they are not think that's much of an admission that's a pretty broad nebulous terminology like a lot of things could be anomalous phenomena i don't think it's indicative of anything much but you can still read into it right there's sure, you sure. can still read into the the fact that why why would you change it from unidentified flying object to Unidentified aerial phenomena, unidentified anomalous phenomena. Well, because what if it's not like physical matter, so exactly. you don't know that it's an object? Exactly. What if flying isn't the right lingo exactly. to describe what it's doing? Exactly. That's what I'm talking about reading into it. Yeah. 
That's what I'm talking about. And because it, it, but it's only like the mouthpieces of the government that are doing this too. Like there's still nobody, there's no, like Congress is now looking into it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that are in the, in the media, but there's really no like on the books, hard, like documentation of them taking it seriously yet. Uh, I well, mean, they clearly take we'll it seriously. It. The question is, is, like, do they admit how seriously they're admitting taking it? it right? Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. As far as like the big like UFO flying saucer craze in America, like it all kind of started with the Roswell incident. Yep. And Betty and Barney Hill. Yep. And they were in the so like the forties and fifties. Right? Yeah. There's like this whole series of. St- of different events. Also, it's kind of like the beginning of like, uh, like sci-fi TV and there's right. always like sci-fi authors and like, we got like the beginnings of like the space program and yep. like, yeah, this type of like topics are really capturing certain people's imagination. Absolutely. Um, but the phenomenon goes back way before that. Exactly, yeah. Even it's, in modern times, like way before Roswell. Um, mm-hmm. And I actually, that's one of the things I brought is I want to read from a snippet from this book. It's called UFOs and the National Security State by Richard Dolan, who's a dope author. He's got a lot of cool books. He's yep. got a YouTube channel also. Uh, I need to check out his YouTube. I haven't seen that. Yeah, he's got he's got a lot of cool stuff. Um, so this is like a two volume like history of UFOs and the government, essentially. Okay. Um, like simultaneous, but not necessarily overlapping. I mean, well, it's obviously called overlapping. UFOs in the national security state. So it's like as bit as best of a history of like the government handling UFOs as as he could do. Yeah. But it is an introduction to the book. He starts off like he gives a chapter to like pre 1940s, like okay. pre Roswell events. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, let's go through that now. I think it's a good time to just go through that now. Okay, so I'm going to read this snippet. Um, in 1897, the United States experienced the first modern wave of sightings. These were the quote unquote airships, which first appeared in San Francisco in late 1896 and moved eastward. Thousands of people, including astronomers, saw them, which typically had lights, usually red, green, or white, move slowly, and seemed to be under intelligent control. Sometimes voices could be heard, whether in English or something unintelligible. On a few occasions, people claimed to see their occupants and even to speak with them. Whoa. Such outlandish sightings got some press. The New York Herald Tribune described a sighting in Chicago on April 9th. 1870 or 1897 that lasted from 8 p.m. until 2 a.m. Wow. Thousands of this. So this is uh, from the New York Herald Tribune. Thousands of amazed persons declared that the lights seen in the Northwest were those of an airship or some floating object miles above the earth. Some declared that they could distinguish two cigar shaped objects and great wings, which is pretty interesting. And great wings. Mm hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I know that. <sighs> Whoa. It's almost like they were seeing, like what they were seeing was advanced for their time, which was airplanes. Yeah. And but, what we are seeing is advanced for our time, which is these flying saucers. Yeah. That seem to move without gravity. It's still cigar shaped objects, which gets reported a lot. Well, you think, like, if you look at the fuselage of an airplane, it looks like a cigar shape. Mm-hmm. And if you think about great wings, mm-hmm. it's the wings of the mm-hmm. airplane. Like, it's cigar shaped. And if you looked at it from a profile, you would see just a cigar shape. Right. And if you this is at 1897. This is before a- airplanes. Right. Especially commercial airliners or something mm-hmm. that would be like Well, this large. is before the Wright brothers. That yeah, they were no, in, like, exa- the early 1900s. Yeah, no, exactly. So this is... This is pre-airplane. So imagine seeing an airplane at that time. Right. Right. 
you would have no idea. And especially the, I think the, there what was, were the color of the lights. They call it airships. Show? I think there was like blimps and stuff back then. No, yeah, there were, but they called them airships because they didn't have a term like right. an airplane for it. Right. They, their term was a ship, like yeah. shipping stuff. Yeah, like, ocean. A, like a boat. Yeah. yeah. A massive ship. What were the color of the, the lights they described there? Uh, they said uh, usually red, red, green, or white. Those are the colors of the white lights on an airplane hmm. that you see blinking when you look up at an airplane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so check this out. Two giant searchlights apparently illuminated the object. Other far stranger incidents occurred. Explanations included many of the standard culprits of later ages, mass hallucination and hysteria, experimental aircraft, private, not military, opium-induced dreams, hoaxes or all of the above in 1897 airship sightings were the most remarkable of the pre-1940s era but other noteworthy ufo events also took place including one in western china in 1926 by the party of explorer nicholas rorick in his book altai himalaya Rorick described the sighting as an interesting occurrence. As he related, his party noticed a high-flying, shiny object. The group brought three powerful field glasses and watched a huge spheroid body shining in the sun, clearly visible against the blue sky and moving very fast. Rorick and his party were certain they saw something real. What was it? What would be flying like that in Western China desert in 1926? No answer ever emerged. These early reports are intriguing, but offer few avenues for further research. UFOs appeared sporadically, elicited minimal response from the public and authorities, and were promptly forgotten. One wonders in any event, what kind of response would have been possible? So, yeah. Hmm. And then he gets into what happens during World War II. World War II and the Foo Fighters. Interesting. The Second World War changed all of this. Before the war, airplanes were scarce and radar non-existent. By the war's end, both were global. In other words, it became much, much easier to detect strange aerial phenomena after the 1940s. Since military personnel were the main users of radar and airplanes they might naturally be expected to encounter more UFOs than the average person. And they most certainly did. Let us take a moment to review some key developments of the American military national security establishment. Interesting. So. No, that I mean, that make totally makes sense. I mean, as techno, as the technology for detecting craft, rises so does the occurrence of sightings or or i mean if you're talking about seeing aircraft where do you have a better view of the sky than up in an aircraft right? yeah obviously that's going to be the place where you, you have the most sightings and still probably the place where we're having so many sightings that were just not being reported mm -hmm. especially with all this stuff like yeah. commander fravor and like some commercial pilots that have encounters with like Something in the in the sky that like buzzes past them and almost you know they almost run into. All right, so this whole next part is a little longer, and I wanted to go over it together. Um, oh no, no, yeah, this, yeah, let me do this next chunk and then we'll take a break here. Okay, um. Uh, a not-so-tame incident occurred in Los Angeles on February 25th, 1942. Uh, yeah. That night, a number of unidentified craft flew over the city and seemingly caused a blackout. At least a million residents awoke to air raid sirens at 2.25 in the morning, and U.S. Army personnel fired 1,430 rounds of anti-aircraft sh anti shells to bring down what they presumed were Japanese planes. But these were not Japanese planes. George Marshall wrote a memorandum to President Roosevelt about the incident, which remained classified until 1974. Marshall concluded that conventional aircraft were involved, probably commercial sources operated by enemy agents for purposes of spreading alarm. 
disclosing locations of anti-aircraft positions and slowing production through blackout. Despite the barrage of American anti-aircraft fire, none of these commercial planes were brought down, although several homes and buildings were destroyed and six civilian deaths were attributed to the barrage. Considering the carnage, the military's explanation was meager. U.S. Navy Secretary Knox even denied that any aircraft had been over the city. He called the incident a false alarm due to war nerves. The local press, needless to say, um, did not take this very well. The Long Beach Independent noted that, quote, there is a mysterious reticence about the whole affair, and it appears that some form of censorship is trying to halt discussion of the matter. It is noteworthy that for 30 years, until the release of the Marshall Memorandum, the Department of Defense claimed to have no record of the event. Five years before Roswell, the military was already learning to clamp down on UFOs. The very next day, after, quote, the Battle of Los Angeles, the crew of the Dutch cruiser Trompen, the Timor Sea, saw a large illuminated disc approaching at terrific speed. The object circled above the ship for three or four hours, then flew off at an estimated speed of 3,000 to 3,500 miles an hour. Obviously, the officer on duty could not identify the object as any known aircraft. Yeah, 3,000 miles per hour. You ain't. <laughs> yeah. And we still don't. So this is the quote-unquote Battle of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, to think that it was commercial sources operated by enemy agents for purposes of spreading alarm, disclosing new locations of any aircraft positions, and slowing production. Despite the fact that we didn't find any debris afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, no, there was no crashed aircraft. No we were shooting, were shot down. they were shooting at a bunch of stuff. They, I mean, they lit up the sky with ammunition that night mm -hmm. and they swear, like you're talking about multiple positions. Sure. War ner nerves are going to get you, but you're talking about a mass sighting. Mm -hmm. And unless it, unless it was like the first person started shooting. So everybody started shooting type of a situation. That's right. But still, I, don't, I mean, it's. I mean, plausible. you can imagine in the beginning of the war, like people were fucking scared. Yeah, our military would be on yeah, edge and super on edge, especially yeah, because yeah, I mean, I I I see that as possible, but at the same time, but I haven't heard of any such technology they had at the time where they could fly an aircraft over a city and cause a mass blackout. Oh, right. Yeah. You got to yeah. think about the blackout part of it, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting. But still, you would think that they would have hit one of the planes. Yeah. Be some kind of evidence other than a blackout. Yeah. Uh, the if next one, the next clip I'll talk about uh, after the break. Yeah, but one. this one um, has to do with a, a really interesting incident in Washington, D.C. Because the reason I brought it up is because you know how always people – like there's like a like a saying where people are like, why don't they just land on the White House lawn? Right. And they basically did. They literally and did, yeah. It's <coughs> pretty interesting, exciting, and yeah, I think people should um, know about this. I know about it, but I'm still interested in, to hear this. Yeah. So anyway, we're we'll right back. going on baby break number one, and uh, – We'll be back. Enjoy some music. Babies are good so far, but definitely fill up our drinks. Yeah. Enjoy the music. We'll be back. Audio.
I know we're back. <laughs> Let the music sink in. I like this one. Yeah, that's nice. Yes, during the whole break, we just sit there and listen to the music, and then we come right back. There's no <laughs> need for a break, but we do it anyway. Right. <laughs> Wake up, mouse. No, we are drinking because everybody's curious by this point. You're three episodes in. You've heard us talk about beer. Just, just yeah. accept it. <laughs> we are drinking uh, Lagunitas, the beast of both worlds, bi-coastal IPA. I'm assuming they, yeah, they use the East Coast flavor with a West Coast clarity is what they're they're claiming. 8% ABV. There you go, Pops. Yeah. I think that works with this standard. I think that's good. He usually like goes for like nines. Yeah. I like it. It's pretty good. It's got like a lot of flavor in the hops. It's not too malty. It's got like a dry mm -hmm. kind of yeah. thing going on. Yeah. I'm a fan. Which I dig. All right. So, so yeah, we're we were back. talking about UFOs before Roswell. Now this one's actually after but um, like this is still early history of UFOs. So I picked this bit out because I find it really interesting that not only has the UFO phenomenon gone on for a long time, but like a lot of the early phenomenon was still like denied and stuff, but it was like reported differently too. Like, yeah, like, well, it was probably like the way they described what they were seeing was a lot different, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you got to think that and I think it I think people are going to talk about it more whatever, but like cultural it's cultural like cultural well yeah like if you come from a certain place in the world you have a certain belief system yeah, your head's exactly. in like a certain space yeah. and you see something in the sky like your experience of that is going to filter through your life lens. Right? Yeah. So the words you choose to describe things, the things that you liken it to will be different. Like calling something a Tic Tac doesn't make sense when like you don't have a culture that has the Tic Tac candy at the grocery store that you stop by True. every day. In yeah. fact, for probably multiple people in the world, that's not their – they don't necessarily come by Tic Tacs and they may not describe it that way. Well, they would probably have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Right. <laughs> like they'd be like, so what shape is it? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So it's a like a cylinder with a ball on each end. Yeah, with a dome. It's a propane tank. Yeah, you may, might still lose some people there. You would, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well. Washington, D.C. So sightings, 1952. This is another excerpt from a little bit later, but still early point in Richard Dolan's book. UFOs in the National Security State. And this is in reference and uh, in refutation to like a lot of people, a lot of debunkers, a lot of like naysayers of the UFO topic. They talk about like, why don't they just come and land on the White House lawn? White House lawn. And yeah, uh, there's, just the whole, reveal themselves. there's the whole like movie meme, like, take me to your leader. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like they land on the White House lawn, they pop out, they want to be taken to the leader, and they're like, Aliens are here. Aliens Humans are here. better deal with us. Everybody just better figure shit out. Right. So, like, people ask why they wouldn't do that, but well, here is an interesting example. So let's, uh, let's listen to this. Washington, D.C. had already been the scene of UFO activity, but what happened for the next two weekends went far beyond anything to that point. The Washington sightings were among the most compelling and dramatic UFO sightings in American history and remain despite any official pretense to the contrary, unsolved. So at 11.40 p.m. on July 19th, what year? 1952, radar at Washington National Airport picked up a formulation of seven objects near Andrews Air Force Base, moving along at a leisurely pace of 100 to 130 miles an hour. Before long, two of the targets suddenly accelerated and vanished off the scope within seconds one of them apparently reached 7,000 miles an hour. Jeez. This got the attention of several controllers, especially when they learned that a second radar at the airport, as well as a radar at Andrews Air Force Base, also picked up the objects. 
for six hours between eight and ten UFOs were tracked on radar. Yeah. The senior air traffic controller for the CAA, Harry G. Barnes, quote, knew immediately that a very l strange situation existed. In his opinion, so this is a quote from Barnes. Okay. The movements were completely radical compared to those of ordinary aircraft. They followed no set course and were not in any formation. We only seemed to be able to track them for about three miles at a time. For six hours, there were, were at least 10 unidentifiable objects moving above Washington. There were not, they were not ordinary aircraft. I can safely deduce that they performed gyrations which no known aircraft could perform. So that's his quote. I mean, yeah. What do you guys say? I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, this guy is trained to he's, he's do... a trained aircraft, air traffic controller. Yeah. This guy's trained to look at radar and to look at all the different instruments and use his eyes when it comes to this stuff. <clears throat> and here you're hearing it from, from him. So several times, at least two of the radar stations displayed the same target simultaneously. But the phenomenon was not restricted to radar tracking. Several Capital Airlines pilots saw the objects visually as orange lights in the same area that the radar indicated they should be. Just where were they? Over the White House and Capitol. <laughs> Sheesh. Man. Uh, a radar visual sighting of 8 to 10 UFOs over such highly restricted airspace is certainly cause to send a few jet interceptors. And this is exactly what happened. By the time the interceptors arrived, shortly before dawn, it was too late. The objects were gone. Mm. How long was that time span? So, how long were they there for or being observed for? For like six hours, they said. Six hours. Wow. Yeah. 11 40 p.m. And they were seen by airliners and they were seen by radar. Yeah. From multiple stations. Yeah. Same Andrews time. Air Force Base and the airport. And jets were scrambled, but by the time they got there, they were gone. Yeah. It took over six hours. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine taking six hours to scramble jets in an in a emergency situation. I mean. Six hours. You would think they have, like, rotating shifts. I mean, this is like the Cold War we're talking about, right? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. like if something is happening like, and it's over the White House, you're talking about six hours it took to scramble jets to find out what was going on there? Yeah. That's a little suspicious. That it actually is a little suspicious. That means that they're just like dragging their feet like, ah, oh, it's probably nothing. Like, or they're but like, I don't know, we know what, what our this like, is. response capability time was back then, but you would think it would be pretty... Hi. Better than that. Yeah. You'd think it at least half that, if not like an hour. Yeah. Like or less. Like what are you, what are you talking about here? Yeah. I mean, it, we're talking about Andrews Air Force Base, which is probably not very far. Are you talking over the White House? Right. Well, I'm talking about where the Air Force Base is. Right. Nearest. Yeah. The White no, House. Andrews is close. So. Why are we taking three hours? And, I mean, you, you got to imagine even at the time they had 24 hours staffed. Like they were 24 hours ready to go. Yeah. Especially I mean, during the Cold, Cold War. They may not have jets in the air in the area. Right. No, hours no, no. A day. But I mean, like ready to have pilots in yeah. planes. Right. Like have pilots on base ready to go. So if you wake them up, they're like firefighters on, a, on an emergency call. They're just shooting to a plane. Right. You would imagine, so based on what you know about mil like what we know about mi like military and house, you know. Yeah. The sighting made headlines the next day, and yet, according to Rappel, nobody bothered to tell the Air Force intelligence about the sighting. At least nobody bothered to tell uh, ATIC which of the, uh, which by now was receiving about thirty UFO reports per day when Rappel arrived in Washington to investigate, he learned that President Truman was personally interested in the affair and wanted a full investigation. 
good news for Repel, except that all the while he was in Washington, Repel could not obtain a military vehicle and had to use a bus. Who then did Truman want to do the full investigation? Clearly not Blue Book. In the week that followed, sightings continued at an intense pace throughout the country. Several occurred over military bases, according to the Washington, D.C. Daily News. The Defense Department ordered jets to shoot down UFOs, which refused to land when ordered to do so. Meanwhile, senior Air Force officers urged intelligence to hold a press conference to relieve public te tension. Whoa. Go back up. Go back up. Yeah. So the Defense Department ordered jets to shoot down UFOs, which refused to land when ordered to do so. Yeah. So this whole like following week to this crazy thing, yeah. there's a bunch of UFO sightings all over the country and some of them are ordered shot down. Uh, Which, like, you know. <laughs> what, what year was this of 1952? Mm hmm. Man, was this around the same time as like War of the Worlds? Yeah, that was in the 50s. radio show. I don't know exactly what the date. Let's see. Let's look it up. Radio broadcast. 1938. Oh, 38. Oh, God. Okay. So this is later, but that's in memory, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you got to be thinking about like kids that were growing up in that era, right? Mm -hmm. Are now in their 30s. Having families in the military, yeah, yeah. I grew up during the time, you know. Just, so just you, something to think about. You could think like mind. skeptics would be like, "Oh, they're just imagining stuff from their sci-fi right. fantasies." Well, they're seeing something, right? Like they've got to be experiencing something, right? I mean, we're and talking about we, radar talked, and visual sighting, yeah. Uh, multiple sources. Yeah, so. so there's something physical happening. It's just the interpretation that is up for mm -hmm. debate in mm -hmm. my mind. It's the interpretation of what is actually happening on a fundamental level. Well, it may be a thing of like what power does our government actually have over it anyway? Well, yeah, probably none. That's why it's 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 been happening for so long and nothing can be done. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's... It's either they figured that figured out that they weren't going to be able to do something in the '40s when Roswell happened and when all these crashes and like all these things, all these sightings started to happen within the time frame of the U.S. government. <clears throat> but it's been happening for a long time, so like, like they just like the time, like the mindset each each generation's mindset is going to change the phenomena. Yeah. And how it manifests. Yeah. So I'm actually going to finish the clip there just because I think we can. This segue. isn't about that, that no. particular setting yeah. in detail. This is just to illustrate the reason I'm reading it for this intro UFO segue. discussion is because I just want to impress upon like you that the phenomenon is old. Yep. It goes back like it's been acknowledged by the government. It hasn't been explained but it's been acknowledged. Right. Um, so these things have happened and there's clearly some interaction. So it's no real surprise that the government would continue to investigate it. And it's also no real surprise that during the height of the cold war, they would suppress a lot of that information. They would keep that information as secret as possible. Of course. Yeah. Because they don't know if it's the Russians and they don't want to let on what they know. Well, and they don't want to, and if, and if they knew it wasn't the Russians, they definitely don't want to let any of that technology, if they find anything. Yeah. Anything be, they can know that the Russians don't is potentially a useful tool. Yeah. National security stuff. <laughs> right. And I, and I do, in a, in a governmental capacity, like national security is part of their mandate. That's something that I support. It's the, it's the, it's the, um, I, I don't want to get political here, but it, but it yeah. shouldn't be political. My, my thoughts on this shouldn't be political, but mm -hmm. it is in a sense that like the whole military industrial complex is 
the problem. Like it's it's yeah. the source. You can you can really trace a lot of things back to it because of its ties to private sector businesses, to private uh, aerospace industries that are in a lot of these UFO stories are indicted in knowing about these or being part of these cover-ups or whatever they might be. Yeah. It's, it's just not really a surprise. So no. like people are like, Oh, what evidence do you have? And I'm like, there's, if you look at the phenomena, if you look at the actual data, if you look at the people, the reports from government and from private witnesses across decades, like going back a hundred years plus, right. Then there's something going on. Something physical is happening that is being interpreted by people all over the world in different yeah. ways. And it's been done throughout time, as we're going to talk about here. Like, I think, yeah, I think if we can understand that there's something going on, yeah, and if we can be open minded enough to not prejudge what we think that is, whether yeah. it's to deny it or to believe it's little green men from a different planet or fairies or, think, or, yeah. or like regardless of the different theories of what it could be to make up your mind on any of those without like abund an abundance of evidence and to call the entire phenomenon any one of those things yep is like to oversimplify absolutely and i think it's 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 good to be candid about the fact that like None of this can be explained materially in a in a way that satisfies science today. So that leading to that, it's well, no. But I'm not saying on it, the I'm cutting not saying edges. Never, like, sure, no, no. So I'm, I'm not saying it. It will never be. Yeah, but it's not. Hasn't been fully explained to like the atheist, materialist, reductionist, like worldview of people who don't even think alien life may even exist at all. Who think we might be the first life out there? Yeah, like to them, like they're like, show me the proof, right? Where's the evidence? And that's just, I I think it's an unacceptable answer given Absolutely. our current age and state of information. Absolutely, and I I hundred percent agree with that. I think that I think that it people's experience, the experiences of the individual, are what need to be investigated when it comes to a lot of this stuff, because a lot of this is like personal. Like it's like, like you are seeing something that is happening that is in a different scope, a different realm of experience that you are tapped into, but you're still capable of experiencing something like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know yeah. that this is going to be some kind of physical, like, integration of like alien life and like it's going to turn out to be some kind of mib like men in black yeah i mean like, i think it could be where there's like a little bit of races. all those things and it could be a combination in certain areas and it could be you know like ex exactly what the final details are if we were able to know everything like they're gonna be unexpected you well, know it's gonna be it's gonna be kind of erroneous in a sense of like it probably won't happen in a in a time frame where um it'll matter much to humans because i feel like technology and the humans are evolving at more of a, at a, at a more of an exponential rate than we assumed mm -hmm. because of technology yeah. and i think that things are going to change us to a point that our fundamental structures of like reality are going to change in a sense even just with ai and like the stuff that's going on with that and like the integration that's going to have with uh with a worldwide connection like you got to think like we're how many generations removed from the same anatomically modern humans that hunted and gathered for sustenance and we're going into an era where we're going to be completely like automatic like it's going to be an auto uh, like automatic society where everything is just done for the human and like i don't know it's going to be like a totally different experience of what it is to be human and that will that is one of the catalysts for evolutionary change in my opinion like that could be the singularity could be could be um 
it's hard to, yeah. I mean, I want to go there, but it's I still I in feel the future. Like it's going to take a while to get to that point. Yeah, still, yeah. I want to circle back to like the phenomena itself and like the idea of these sightings going back because mm-hmm. like back in time. Yeah. Once we, if we can grant that there's something happening that we don't understand, regardless of what it is, then we can start understanding that if you look back in the history of humanity and you start looking at different events and paintings and artifacts and evidence and, you know, people's descriptions of religious uh, happenings. Yeah, like rituals and stuff and... Well, like just like things events, that people massive events that happened in yeah, history for yeah. that religion. So there are some paintings. Uh, here's one called the Crucifixion Crucifixion of Christ. Uh, it's in the Visoki de Canti Monastery in Kosovo. It was painted in the 1300s. And yeah, look at the background. That's this here. Yeah, we're gonna have all this. It'll you'll be able to see it if you're on YouTube. Um, if you're on any of the other ones, you go to the show notes. Yeah. It should be on the chapter art in Apple yeah. Podcasts and Overcast. Um, th- yeah. So this is a painting. We got the crucifixion. We got like people standing around Jesus, angels flying above with their wings. But then we also have on the top left and the top right in the skyline is two beings, which are clearly in some sort of craft. Some sort of ball of light or ball of tech. The one on the right looks more like a solid, like titanium Mm -hmm. or, you know, it looks like a cross section to me. It looks like it's showing the craft or maybe their windows. Well, no, it's definitely a cross section. Yeah. It's like showing the openness of it. Like it's Mm -hmm. showing the in-person inside of it. Mm -hmm. So you would imagine there being a finished dome and then a finished cone to finish off the nose there. They look like stars or like comets, but they have people sitting in them. Yeah. Which is sure looks like a UFO to me. <laughs> what is someone in the 1300s doing portraying that? Yeah, exactly. How do they even like come up with that idea? Yeah. Uh, here's another one. This one is. Yeah, the zoom in on that one. Um, the Miracle of the Snow. Masolino di Panicale. Yeah, what is that? So, this portrays a legend of snowfall that happened a hot summer day in Rome in the 4th century. Jesus and Mary seem to be overlooking the incident from the top of a cloud, but behind them are a lot of disc-shaped objects. These objects could be thought of as clouds, but for a painter who paints or who pays extensive attention to details, yeah. such de- such simplistic depiction of clouds doesn't quite seem right. Yeah, no, that looks absolutely ridiculous. That sounds absolutely ridiculous when you're looking at this. It looks more like craft that are, like, pushing clouds on, like, the front end of them. Yeah, it almost looks like it's something that's being, like, brought in. Yeah, see, like, yeah, oh, that, yeah, 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 that yeah, looks yeah. like clouds being pushed at the edge absolutely. of a saucer-shaped object yeah. or, like, surrounding it. But you clearly see the saucer object on the inside, and there's a whole bunch of them behind, going all the way to the to the horizon. Yeah, and then these people like standing in a town square. One guy's like raking hoeing. some snow. Isn't it, that? It looks like a hoe, and it looks like he's using it on cement, which is weird. No, because they said that they got snow, right? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, so that's snow. They got he's snow cleaning on up a the hot snow. summer day or something like that. That's what yeah. they said. Weird. Yeah, what are you doing hoeing that snow, bro? <laughs> You're a hoe for that snow. Uh, this one's called the Madonna with St. Giovanni. Oh, yeah, I've seen G- this one before. Um, yeah, this look, painting at, look at the look of from around the 15th right shoulder, century. On her left shoulder, sorry. Yeah. Depicts Mary, mother of Jesus, looking down while... In the background, you see a clear picture of what appears to be a UFO flying above. And zoom in. While a man on the ledge yeah. blocks the sun with his hand and stares at the strange object flying yeah. in the sky. What the hell? <laughs> Dude, that looks like an NFT. One of those damn, not an NFT, but like one of those images, like the 3D mm. or the 4D images where you can like zoom in and like continue. The, what are those called? Yeah, NFT. Or, oh, 
You're talking about one like the frac- fractal. Fractal. Ones? Yeah. The fractal like 3D images that like people you can like zoom in and just continue the image. Yeah, but we can zoom on that. Zoom. Yeah, zoom in. We could do a. We'll do a full. We'll do a full picture and a zoomed in picture of this. Yeah. Because yeah, look, it's somebody blocking this, the sun or at, or like holding he's standing something up with his hand up to his. Yeah. Forehead, like like he's blocking the sun. Yeah, and he's exactly. staring in the distance, and back out there is what looks like a UFO. In Something the in the sky. Something. Yeah. I mean, what would you be painting in the sky? I mean, it sure looks saucer shaped to me. Yeah, it looks like a little mushroom cap. Yeah, it looks exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, from a collection called the Akambaro Figures in 1944. A German shopkeeper, Waldemar Julesrud, claimed to have stumbled upon a mysterious figurines while on horseback near Acambaro in Guanajuato, Mexico. <laughs> I, I apologize. I'm not laughing at the names. I'm laughing at Dean trying to pronounce the names. That's all. Sorry. <laughs> just, just let everybody know. He said that he found over 30,000 of them with the help of a farmer. What is distinct about the figurines is that they appear to depict dinosaurs and humans living together. Additionally, there were also some strange figurines that many people say resemble flying saucers and even aliens. Here's an example. Yeah, I mean, that does look a lot like what we just saw in the background of that one image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you've got the Kumbaya artifacts. Kumbaya. It's a civilization that Kumbaya. inhabited the areas around Cauca River Valley and the western slopes of the Andes. Um, but these are a bunch of little gold figurines of what look like. Yes. I wanted to talk about these, dude. They look like planes. Absolutely. And this one looks like a propeller plane. That looks like one of our earliest planes. Mm -hmm. And then we've got one some of them like are more like shuttle or jet shaped. Yeah. yeah. That one on the bottom left. And they're also like, like clearly jet. stylized to look like insects or birds. Right. Because those are the depictions of something flying that you know in your culture. Right. But if you're, imagine, right? Imagine even today in your a culture, uh, one of these uncon uncontacted tribes in um, the uncon uncontacted tribes in that are Amazon. in the Amazon. And there's, I think there's another one on an island somewhere. Yeah, somewhere in like the... In like the Indian Ocean area. Something like that, yeah. But there's like, there's people who live today without knowing that they're like all this civilization around them, right? Mm -hmm. And they just live their mm -hmm. life as hunter-gatherers. Yeah, like they're they completely hunter-gatherers living uncontacted yeah. from us. Yeah. And, and they, and they imagine looking up into the sky as one of them and seeing, and seeing our aircraft, our air, seeing our, our rockets our shoot rockets, up into the air. The satellites satellites flying across the sky. Starlink. Starlink. Those and like, like Starlink trains. Yeah. What would they think that is? They would, I mean, exactly. And like, imagine them trying to make art and they, and they come up with some kind of religion or they come up with some kind of. Or maybe I mean, they were contacted yeah. and like they were told just, about Christianity like Western or they were society told about something. Before technology, how would you paint these flying things? Absolutely. If you go back to like 16th century Europe and you yeah. show them stuff flying in the sky that looks like shuttles and jets and stuff, they're going to paint it as birds and insects too. Because that's what they know. Yeah. Like you don't have context for what these things are, but these shapes clearly. So they, some people claim these are like just not real i don't like not real at all it. yeah like, like they could be some sort of hoax right okay but but there was one um one thing i saw and it was the, the i think it was the one on the bottom left or maybe it was the one on the bottom right uh -huh. i think it was the one on the bottom right they made a they took a 3d image of it and they blew it up in scale and they oh, actually yeah. tested they made it a out model. and they made a model of it and they tested it out and it was actually aerodynamic like it actually flew. Yeah. Obviously, that's the general shape. Like, sure. But I imagine they would have to do like 
certain I things. I guess, yeah, that's Like, true. curve the wings in a certain way. But it flew. Yeah. I mean, this one totally looks like a prop plane to me. Yeah, you get that thing spinning, it's a prop plane. Yeah. That um, is a World War II, World War One prop plane. But even it? if these are hoaxes, like, even if the paintings... I mean... You don't need any one piece of this. It's not about resting the case on any one piece of evidence. It's about recontextualizing once you can admit there's a phenomenon and looking back in history and understanding that what how, how would humans back in those times Interpret. describe this phenomenon and they'll use the best terminology they have. Yeah. They'll describe it in whatever way they can. And if you look at religions and this is why Diana Pasolka is such a yeah. uh, such a great person. Per, yeah, like a researcher reference. that I really yeah. like admire. Her book, American Cosmic, and then the new one is uh, Encounters. Encounters, yeah. Um, I'm finishing that right now. It's so good. I need to read that one. Um, and then I just sent Drew this uh, video with Jesse Michaels that she just did. Interview. Yeah, the interview we'll, is we'll fantastic. We'll post a link. Yeah, the interview with Jesse Michaels is fantastic. He is great interviewer yeah so like she is a of, religious video. studies professor she's yep. straight out of academia she was never into the ufo topic but she would study religions from like a agno like regardless of a personal beliefs if you're an academic religious studies you need to professor, come at it from uh, you need to come at it without believing or disbelieving you're trying to analyze trying the to phenomena the of humans believing in religious events yeah. and studying them and the details of them and what people report yeah and she's taken some of these like um, writings from some of the saints, I think Francis of Assisi, mm -hmm. and like gotten them like translated, retranslated outside of being through the church. Yeah. And what he's describing in his like famous sighting of seeing Jesus and coming out of the sky, he doesn't mention Jesus at all. And what he mentions could be like if you read it to that modern person, it sounds like a UFO sighting. Yeah, that's insane. And same with like Ezekiel's wheel in the Bible. Um, look at like uh, Hindu texts, any like pantheistic religion. Yeah, the Vimana. It's rife with gods flying throughout the sky. In the Vimana. Mm hmm. Um, same, like. Uh, I mean, it's all over the world. You're seeing this kind of evidence where they talk about this stuff. And the mainstream, a lot of the time, they just chalk it up as uh, analogies or they were like right. they were they were portraying the 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 feeling of the era. And like, you know, mm -hmm. like, but they're they're they're. They're the ones putting that on yeah. the words. The words aren't themselves saying that what they're talking about and what they're describing is is fiction. Right. They're talking about it as fact. They're talking about it as as this is what happened and it changed this, 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 and this or whatever about our society. And mm -hmm. like things grew from then. They, they gained knowledge. Like there are so many things that happened around those mythologies. Yeah. I want to talk uh, like also about like how does modern science talk about a lot of these topics? Cause I find that super interesting as well. Okay. So like if you are one of these, uh, types, I used to be this type, like I, in my life, I've bounced back and forth from like believing all this, like new agey stuff to like hardcore atheist science, like all this other stuff's probably not true and back multiple times. And I think I'm at like what I feels comfortable to me sort of hybrid position between the two, which is that I grant that there's enough evidence that a lot of these events exist, or at least there's something to them. They're worth being looked into. Yeah. And I think in a lot of cases there, if you're open-minded, there is the um, evidence there. Right. Um, but anyway, so if you're of this other view that like, you know, we haven't been visited and that none of these things are real and you're a scientist and you're an astronomer and you're looking out in the sky and you're thinking about the evolution of the earth and how old the earth is and the solar system is and the Milky Way galaxy. The universe. Like, all that. So much time has passed 
since the formation of the Milky Way to where our solar system, our sun, our planet existed, that other places in the galaxy would have such a head start yeah. in terms of developing life. Right. And developing and destroying and going through a cycle just like we are going through. Right. So this is the famous Fermi paradox is he's making these observations and he's saying, you know, I, I think it's like a famous meeting where a bunch of scientists in like the lunchroom, they had this conversation Yeah, and that's what resulted in the Fermi paradox. And so they were going down this line of reasoning and then he's like, wait a minute, where are they? Right. So like if, if earth like planets exist out there, which we, especially now with James Webb and everything, we know they do. Yeah. Um, then they've had billions of years ahead of us to develop technology, to evolve, to explore the galaxy. So where are they? Where are they? They should yeah. be here. We should be able to look out and point our telescopes stuff. and like see a bunch of activity. Yeah. Because obviously, as we're advancing in technology, we're developing all these technologies and radio communication and all that. So obviously, someone more advanced than us would at least have that. But like that has such an uh, assumption in it. Well, are we that also we would use radio technology if right. we were that advanced? Yeah, like that's that's assuming that we are going to be of the same technology we are now, right? But then, but with a little bit more advanced propulsion or something like, you know, right? Like if you think like we're making so much progress in science, we're developing all these new technologies, we're seeing into the atom, we're seeing subatomic, right? Like, we're starting to map out mathematically the way the universe works, like, and we're using radio technology. We're using radio they? telescopes. Like, we assume we're making a, a footprint out there for others to pick up. Um, so why aren't right. we seeing that from others? Why aren't they here already? They should be. But... Are they? And that's, like, the <laughs> misnomer of the whole thing, because it relies on you, like, taking this all this UFO evidence for granted. If you're if you're willing to explain away the entire UFO phenomenon, that's a valid question to pose. Where the fuck is everyone? Yeah. But once you are at least open minded that there's something there's something here, even if we can't perfectly explain it, then the Fermi paradox isn't a paradox anymore. And you're like, where you are they? Yeah. Well, the answer they're is here they're somewhere. here. We just somewhere. don't know we don't what know to make of it. These the stuff is mysterious. They're clearly more advanced. They they interact totally differently. Like it's weird. Yeah. Combination of time dilations and forgotten memories and time missing time itself. and like lights and people's having life changing events. Yeah. Um, people, you know, communicating with beings having. Weird spiritual changes after encountering the phenomenon. Like you get Absolutely. abductions, you get cattle mutilations, you get like this phenomenon's deep and big, and you can look almost everywhere and find clear evidence of weirdness, yep. even if it's not clear definition of what actually is happening. Yeah. So here they are. What do we make of it? Yeah. Well, a lot of it goes back to like the chemistry of the the universe too like we don't even know how chemist like the chemistry of like because we're flinging we're we are moving through the galaxies and we're moving through the universe at such a rate too like we you would think that we'd eventually come across something mm -hmm. but i guess everything is moving at a away from everything else right or is that yeah. but like eventually you would think something would intersect just naturally too i don't know that's just a totally different tangent but yeah, I think, I think if you can, if you're acknowledging that this phenomena is something and something non-human, um, it's seems like a big assumption to assume it's only been happening recently. Yeah. If it's always been happening, then that has huge, huge implications too. Cause this right. thing is clearly like interacting with humans in some way. Mm -hmm. And if it is, then, then back to our conversation from last week about the Younger Dryas and extinction yeah. events, like all of a sudden these stories and religions that talk about civilization being wiped out and then these people coming out of the sky, coming out of the sea and teaching them 
telling them to make arcs beforehand and you know like all of a sudden you know maybe this is all part of the same phenomenon too and it's not just part of a phenomenon it's actually part of our history yeah if it's part of our physical like actual history of like how humans developed from the last cataclysm like (laughs) i mean it could go back infinitely longer than that like we could be talking about like pre humans like the humans from before like Mm -hmm. this is a theory this isn't like my favorite theory but it's a theory of like humans from before having like before this ice age before the the calamities of the younger dryas event and all that kind of stuff um them being technologically advanced enough to have gone outside of our solar solar system and then come back or be on an arc uh, in, you know, space and have come back to give us the technology to reseed. And, but they also still had that technology and they were clearly different than they were clearly a, a separate class from the people who were on earth at that time that survived. So they would probably go off and start their own civilization somewhere since they obviously had the technology or, or not so far away, right? Because there's still yeah. a lot of theories of like or the if there's, moon yeah. being, you know, being an artificial, being an artificial uh, body. Base. Like there's like the weird all this conspiracy stuff about like the objects on like the face on Mars. And yeah, like different weird stuff that have been found out of like the rover photos and videos. Right. right. Um, These there's there's so many like if you if you accept that this is possible, like that something is happening, like. Like the furthest we go back in in recorded history is only ten thousand years ago, right? Like we don't know much more than what everything happened before 10, that years ago. is considered myth. There yeah. is stuff from from like that was passed down for sure. Yeah, but that, in the form of all, myth that is of the that time before that, and we have no evidence to confirm or deny this. So everything coming out of it is speculation, right? So. Knowing that, mm-hmm. it's our jobs as humans, as and and obviously the scientists are the ones leading this charge. But like, as just civilians, and like just 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 sit with these ideas, mm-hmm. and like allow yourself to be open minded enough to take in these ideas and 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 see if it fits with your. Yeah, for me, like building on your point, like this idea of this phenomenon overlapping with like spiritual experience and stuff. Sure. The, if you, if you take all these different encounters and you take mythology, like they're talking about angels, they're talking about demons, they're talking about, you know, serving God and they're talking about, you know, like corruption and malevolence. Like they're, and that makes sense to me because if you look at human society, there's no area of human society where you can like zoom in and not get examples of both like great goodness and great evil. Absolutely. Like people are capable of both. And if life is greater than human beings on earth and includes entities of whatever kind across the universe, then like there's going to be both as well. Like there's no way it can be all one thing or, or the other. That's another, that's another thing that Diana Pasolka talks about too, is like the, and I think, um, 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 Jesse gave her the idea. It was like the power. Um, what was it? The power of, um, you know um, what I'm talking about? Yeah. That statement he the made. statement he made. It was like a forcing forcing event or something yeah, like that. Event. A forcing event is like, uh, and they also referenced how like evil, like evil in humanity and evil in um, like um, nature. Even like you think about like the devastating events that nature can have, mm-hmm. but also the super healing and like great like great events of the it's like a churning over for it's like but it's a it's a what they just what she describes is like uh as like a building block like it's something that like no matter what and no matter what part of the framework of reality evil is a building block just as much as goodness is a building block of the framework of of this thing 
it's like creation and destruction. I think if Absolutely, you can yeah. see it without judgment, like it's yin and yang, it's yeah. chaos and order. It's the duality it's, of, of, of life. Yeah. Uh, but within that, you're going to have those whole complications um, of, yeah. you know, you'll have matter some influences that are more orderly or more like peaceful and some that matter. are more like chaotic or malevolent. And, you know, that's where everything from angel encounters to demon encounters to abductions to yeah. people, shamans who go into trances and experience yep. entities to yep. taking ayahuasca or DMT yep. and interacting with machine elves. And a lot of times the, uh, the outcome of a lot of those instances where they come out with some kind of like, um, like, of like some kind of like drastic realization. Mm hmm. There's um, both sides of it. Like they, mm -hmm. like there's the negative and the positive. Like they see both sides of it. There also seems to be something interesting um, that people report about the UFO phenomenon. People who are like really immersed in all the case studies and stuff is that there seems to be like a difference of perspective and whether or not people can see it in the first place. Um, right. So there's some events there. Oh, there was one I brought. Let me add it to my computer real quick. It's this uh, sighting where an orb flies into a house with a husband oh, and wife. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that yeah. One. yeah. And it just like moves from room to room and down the hall. And, and like, it heals their dog. Oh, I didn't. It heals their dog? Yes. This one's crazy. What was their dog diagnosed with? Uh, it was paralyzed. Oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> this one. That headline. Dude. <laughs> it's a weird headline. <laughs> this is basically the same thing. <laughs> Small UFO that flew into the house and cured a paralyzed dog. <laughs> so whether or not you think this is real, like this is a real example of like human Hang nature. On. Hang on. Where are we at time-wise? Uh... Can you go to the other? This Where was published in 2018. No, no, no. Where are we at? Um, Anomalien.com. No, no, no. What? Where, where are we at in time? Oh, time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we're over. Yeah, I was going to say, let's, I, I think we, this is something All right, we yeah, should come yeah. back to. Oh, I got to take a piss. One. Okay. We'll be back, people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> talk uh, aliens and, and curing paralyzed dogs. This uh, Enjoy this beat, which is called Puppies and Chocolate. <laughs> oh, my God. That's perfect.
Me and Carlo, we made that beat. He was like, what should we call it? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. It's just so nice. It feels good. Like, <laughs> like puppies and chocolate. Just feels good. <laughs> and you were just so, like. That's why we named it Puppies and Chocolate. Yeah. It just so happens it coincided with uh, where we're going next. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway. So instead of puppies and chocolate, uh, the next the sequel will have to be puppies and aliens. Yeah, puppies and UFOs. All right. So um, we're about to get into the story. Um, I've the so like the source was the guy this happened to. He wrote a book about it. Okay. Um, but this is a story written about the book and about the experience, kind of summarized um, from nice. anomalien.com. And I'll leave the link. So, <laughs> one of the authors of this book t- book is a lawyer named Ray Hernandez, and the story happened directly to him and his family in his home. At that time, his family had a dog named Nana, a Jack Russell Terrier. In 2012, Nana w- was already 15 years old and was rapidly developing arthritis in her extremities. At her first um, gait became weak. At first, her gait became weak, and then it became increasingly difficult for her to walk. Then problems with her kidneys and her heart began. Nana was treated, but it only got worse. On March 3rd, 2012, Nana was unable to move her paws and now could only lie down, raise her head, and bark. Her owners called the vet, but the only but they only suggested it come to turns and humanely euthanize the sick pet. Euthanasia was scheduled for the next day. Ray Hernandez's wife, Dolce Hernandez, was a devout Catholic, took this very hard and began to pray for Nana. In the morning around six o'clock, Nana began to bark relentlessly. Dolce decided that maybe she wanted to go to the toilet and took the dog in her arms and then began to go down to the first floor of the living room so that she could then go out into the courtyard where Nana would relieve herself. And there in the living room, Dolce saw a luminous silver object about a meter in diameter, which was shaped like an inverted horseshoe. So, like, that's a weird way to describe it, but, like, the letter U, but upside down. Mm. Okay. Um, This object hovered above the floor. For some reason, the devout Dolce mistook it for an angel. When my wife saw this object, she immediately knelt down and began to pray. She was still holding our dog in her arms and asked this angel that if she was truly an angel, then let him make sure that her dog Nana did not suffer from this illness. A few minutes later, Dolce began calling her husband and asking him to come downstairs. Ray did not want to go out of bed, and she herself went upstairs and pulled him out of bed. He asked her what happened, but she just said, you will see for yourself. You will see. I followed my wife downstairs. She stopped next to Nana, who was lying on the floor, still completely paralyzed on her back. Then my wife and dog disappeared right before my eyes. Almost immediately after that, I entered a kind of hypnotic trance. It was as if you were in a state of awakening from a dream, half conscious, half in a dream world. According to Ray, while in this altered state of consciousness, he did not even think about what had just happened to his wife. He was completely stunned and looked at this strange object in his living room. But if Dolce described this object as an inverted letter U, then Ray saw in front of him a glowing multicolored translucent object of a rectangular shape. Only its dimensions were still the same, about a meter in diameter. The object hovered at the height of about 120 centimeters above the living room floor. Ray called this object the plasma energy creature. Then he developed a kind of tunnel vision thanks to which he could only see the space that was about a meter around the object. The rest of the living room was hidden from view. He couldn't understand what was happening and didn't even think about his wife and dog, who had just disappeared into thin air right before his eyes. Automatically, he went up to the bedroom on the second floor, went to bed, and quickly fell asleep. According to Ray, this plasma energy being then completely controlled his consciousness. I immediately fell asleep, and I don't remember having any conscious thoughts during those 45 minutes. After I woke up from the semi-conscious hypnotic trance, I ran downstairs. Entering the living room, Ray saw his wife and dog Nana materialize in the same place where they had disappeared 45 minutes earlier. 
I don't think he actually means he saw them like materialize. I think he went downstairs and saw them thereafter because he went upstairs and slept for another 45 minutes. Right. <clears throat> but they said materialize. Yeah, that's a weird choice of words. If you hear him describe it in other things, he doesn't say it that way. <laughs> anyway, uh, began dancing around the room. Uh, so, yeah, Dolce began dancing around the room and playing with the fully healed Nana who was jumping and hopping back and forth as if she was a puppy again. At the same time, Dolce joyfully, joyfully shouted, an angel cured her. My reaction to it was like an atomic bomb exploded in my head. My reality was completely shattered. I just couldn't cope with what had just happened. About a week later, we took Nana to our vet, our vet and he asked what was wrong with her. We were too um, embarrassed to tell him what really happened. Instead, told him we changed her diet. He couldn't believe us because what happened was unbelievable. We asked him if we should continue giving her previously prescribed arthritis pills and diuretics, and he said no because she's very healthy now. We immediately stopped giving her any medications, and she lived for about another year, spending these 11 months in the rhythm of the life of a young dog. And then in the last two weeks of her life, she quickly sank to such a level that we finally had to euthanize her at Phil's clinic. It was at that time that we finally told Phil what really happened. Phil looked at me and my wife with a very strange look and completely ignored our statement about why Nana was actually cured. We realized how crazy he thought we were um, and changed the subject. He then continued his conversation as if nothing had happened. This is exactly how almost all of our friends reacted when we told them about our UFO experience. According to Ray Hernandez, his wife does not remember anything about what happened to her in those 45 minutes when she disappeared and was passed out. It was a classic episode of Missing Time among abducted UFOs. She didn't remember leaving the living room at all. She also firm, firmly convinced that she saw an object out of a completely different shape than the one her husband saw. According to Dolce, it was as if there was no 45 minutes missing for her. She didn't feel any gap in the time she saw Ray down in the living room and the time she ran around the living room with the cured dog. Yeah. According to ufologist Preston Dennett, the case of the dog, Nana, is only the fourth case known in ufology of UFOs curing animals. Other cases involved an injured rooster <laughs> that was healed by strange rays of light and two dogs that became much more energetic and lively after the sighting of a UFO. Interesting, there's also an even more unique case where extraterrestrial beings were concerned about the state of plants. In particular, ufologist Diana Tessman reported an incident in which a forestry worker came face to face with an alien who gave him advice on how to keep the forest trees healthy. Mm. Anyway, that's the end of the article. But what I found super interesting about that and why Diana Pasolko mentions it. Um, she mentions the idea that like people, they experience things differently, right? Yeah. Like, so even like, even though a marriage, right. Even within a marriage, they have two different mindsets yeah. and one sees it as an angel in a totally different shape and yeah. someone else sees it as something else and yeah. like a UFO or anomalous object. But yeah, that definitely tells you unless like, they're completely fabricating something happened to their dog. Yeah, I mean, even the, like, it did sound like from at least this, you know, I don't know what the original report said, but it sounded like the thing you went to, like, a different vet or something. No, no, it was like the, it same, was the vet. same vet. Yeah, so originally um, they took him to the vet after the dog was healed. And it was the vet they had been seeing. And yeah, that's what I was the wondering. The vet was like, confused about why the dog was healed. Yeah, and they just okay. said they changed the diet. Okay. And then later on, after the dog actually died, that they took it to that same vet. Right, right, right. And that's when they finally told okay. the vet what happened. Okay. But. And the vet was like, uh, I'll just uh, <laughs> not even acknowledge that. Yeah, just uh, pretend like it was the diet. And he's like, okay, crazy person. <laughs> Just diet is fine. <laughs> he might have believed it a little more if they had told him that originally. Maybe, maybe. But some people just depending are on not in a mindset where they're even open to something like that yeah, as that a is true. as a story of something that happens in the world. You know. Yeah. 
which is why like Ray describes this like when he sees the dog the next morning it's just a nuclear bomb went off in his yeah, head his you know whole like the world had shifted especially experiencing what he had just experienced right so whether or not you believe this like put yourself in the mindset of that story yeah and you might start to understand what it's like for some of these um observers and witnesses and right. people who are experiencers yeah and even to parallel that with like a lot of like Jacques Vallée's work and like how he talks about like the parallels between modern and um historical mm -hmm. like UFO uh, um scenarios yeah and how he kind of talks about how like the like there's like f like even like back in ancient times when they talked about like fairies and right. like goblins or whatever, like demons and angels mm -hmm. and all these different things like that was just the product of the time. So like, you know, to deduce like whatever might be going on in your life at the time that you're really focused on might be a central aspect of how you experience this phenomena. Mm -hmm. And it might be something that is just on such a level that you can't comprehend it. That's why a lot of these abductees talk about like time dilating and like um, just like different types of beings. Like there's like tall blondes and there's, yeah. there's the grays and then there's, you know, the there's all the different species. Tall blondes, gray, of, the small grays and the tall grays. Right. There's the reptilians. Reptilians. The mantids. Yeah. Ones that like look like praying mantises, um, and there's a bunch of other weird ones. There's some yeah. that look like like the UFO or like uh, Bigfoot, like right. kind of hairy, bigger creatures. And then there's a like random one offs of like all sorts of crazy stuff. And then there's humans, like there's like humans. yeah, there's <laughs> there's some like, that are just they just look human, yeah, not even weird, <clears throat> and you know, like that makes sense to me. Like that's part of like. It would be that way, you know? Yeah. If human life, True. if biology and human life didn't start on this planet, then as, um, as, uh, like a freaking Fermi had pointed out, yeah, then it's going to be so much older than us. Right. That's why I brought up the Fermi paradox because, like, once you realize it's not a paradox and they probably are here, if, that is in fact what's going on with the phenomenon, then like you automatically, it only makes sense that it's ancient. It only yeah. makes sense that it would have been here before us. It only makes sense that like maybe they're far beyond electromagnetic communication. And so we don't see radio waves out there. Um, and maybe um, they have control over consciousness and yeah. they actually understand like the laws of physics and what you can and can't do. Yeah. What looks like magic and weird and high strangeness to us is technology for them. Or even just, just part of their, yeah, just and anatomy that's it, in a sense. Right. And that's if it's even partly the explanation of right. creatures who are biological, like materialists who, live, who came from planets on right. other materialistic view of it all. Like right. instead of like the spiritual view of, of it all. But I mean, given enough time, I don't see how the materialist view doesn't become the spiritual view because your technology will become so advanced that it's going to be magic. Absolutely, yeah. It'll definitely be magic. I mean... Like stopping time and communicating telepathically. Like we already are close to like coming up with Neuralink and the first like, tele like technological telepathic communication. Like... Given billions of years of evolution, it's really not that out there that that could just be a sense for other biological creatures. Yeah. Even if we don't see the organs for that in ourselves, that's no proof that it's not well, a and thing it, in it, other species. Well, and you also got to think about like if you accept the um, like multiverse or multidimensional aspect of the universe mm -hmm. too and like how – the like if you were to imagine like we are a 3d being in a four-dimensional world right well we're a 4d being or a 4d being because we exist in time too so but we, either even still like we are but that's 
given that time is an actual dimension. But, right. Um, but there's like all these theories on multiple dimensions and like they can. They yeah. Have well, theories on, multiple dimensions or multiverse or. Yeah. Whatever you like. Like if time call. travel is actually possible yeah. and it's not a multiverse, maybe it's like, even if it's like the back to the future version of time travel where going back and forth in time actually changes the one true timeline and you right. can it's alter cyclical. historic events. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> that's interesting. That's where the phenomena, phenomena like intersects with things like the Mandela effect. Yeah. Which would be fun to do an episode. Yeah. On. Well, I was thinking too, like with the, if it being like, if you're talking about like the UFO specifically, um, and you and you think that way about the multiverse and stuff and like like different dimensional beings existing in a different dim- like in a higher dimension like what what that might look like for them to intersect yeah. with our dimension in our reality Man. so like the thought that like UFOs and these spiritual events and like these things that happen are like just uh like an one of us like dissecting uh, an animal, mm-hmm. you know, in the two dimensional world, like an ant or like a thing, like whatever it might be, like putting them under a microscope and like changing the altering the course of that. Yeah. That thing organism. Mm-hmm. And like, if you're in a different dimension and actually perceiving things, like you might have access to all this different information even if you're space. not in a different dimension, even if you just have like higher understanding Awareness. of like physics, you can like predict future and past more accurately too. So you'll have more information in that case too. So you can actually affect world events just by having enough knowledge, you know, like, but if UFO phenomenon really points to a real thing. And if you go down the paths of like intersecting fields, like, like paranormal research, yeah. um, shamanism, religion, DMT, and like, um, psychedelics, psychedelic studies. Um, there does seem to be something physical, but also maybe something, call it spiritual but maybe it's energetic if you want to use like materialist science terms we don't know what kind of like energy entities could exist and they could be made out of what we call you know scientists call dark matter right stuff that we can't really directly observe but still have an effect on on life right yeah but it also could be multiverses, different dimensions. So there's, there's just so many possibilities. I, this topic is huge, man. It's huge, yeah. We're going to go in a lot of different directions and tie a lot of things in. And I But mean, for yeah, those of you who are, are like skeptical circles. on this topic and aren't believers, I think – I mean, you don't have to be a believer in anything specific, but like yeah. hopefully believers that there's something Open happening – open-minded that there could be something happening at the very least yeah then you know if you're not there yet then i would check out obviously all the modern stuff like you know david fravor yeah and uh what's ryan graves um, grush david grush and all of his his original stuff is a little like you can listen to his congressional testimony and his original interviews and he seems almost a little dodgy yeah Uh, but his later stuff with uh Jesse Michaels and um, Rogan. Rogan and Ross Ulbricht has been yeah. talking about him a lot. Um, check some of that stuff out because yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's it's at least enough to know something's happening. Yeah, I mean we're talking about congressional hearings and they're talking about like over oversight committees and they're they're yeah. trying to get like. Um, transparency within the government when it comes right. to these UAP. There appears to be like factions within the government and like groups right. of them that this actually do apparent. want this out and yeah. other, you know, groups that want it to stay completely yeah. top secret and hidden. Yeah, it's in it's in jeopardy of being um, vetoed by the House of Representatives, right? The right. bill for right. transparency or whatever. To get it added to the NDAA. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, all this stuff is fascinating topics. I want to talk about crop circles too. Yeah, like there's some cool stuff. I've about. never dove super deep. I've seen like a couple documentaries here and there, and nothing. Yeah, like, huh. yeah. I don't know how serious to take it, but that's interesting. But I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, I do want to talk about eventually Eric Weinstein's. Oh yeah, recent stuff that he's talked about with UFOs and stuff, and mm-hmm. how he's kind of gotten into it. Yeah, he's it was a, uh, that conversation. It was Jesse Michaels that did that, right? Yeah. Where he got him to talk with uh, Hal Putoff yep. right, about the UFO topic. Yep. yep. And it really changed his view a bit. It's a. Uh, it's and he has interesting points. He does. Yeah. Hal Putoff. Yeah. No, Eric. Oh no, Eric. Now has, that he's like come around a little bit, he's like finally been like. He'll he'll he's talk about like he like huh it like. If you look back in the history of academia and like the people who were top performers in schools, the people yep. we were in class with in my generation, like yep. there is an odd amount of them that went into like private, private, stuff. um, private science and never published. And like a lot of them have ended up at some of these, what are like, you know, kind of black budget contractors who don't really talk about what they do in general. Yeah, it's like the aerospace companies and stuff. Mm-hmm. A lot of these like Lockheed Martin and like yeah. Aero. Um, and Jesse Michaels in his um he actually has a video dedicated to that. Yeah. To Eric Weinstein's like breakdown yeah. of that and like that whole idea of tracking the geniuses and the brain drain out of academia into the private yep. black um groups. Yeah, he's uh he's definitely somebody to look out for in the coming. I mean, it's sensible because look at the Manhattan Project, look at the Cold War. Like, you're gonna, you know, if these types of things are possibilities, if there's life out there, if these if these craft out there, if there's this ability to possibly learn and whole new technology and get the upper hand against your, you know, yeah, political rivals. You know who then, was a Ross Coulthart. Yeah. I mean, R- Ross Coulthart talked about um, how, and also Eric Weinstein mentioned how, like, they like they bring in a lot of these, like, you know, really smart people, but a lot of them are only of certain disciplines and, like, yeah, or they only have a certain focus and they're, oh. only, they're only compartmental. Like, a lot of this stuff's yeah. compar- compar- probably compartmentalized. And, and You're talking about, like, the S4 stuff. Yeah, and, and like, he yeah. talks about how, like, or Ross Coulthard talks about how, like, um, like a lot of this, it's, it's this delaying modern science and yeah, the studies. A lot of this modern push through, um, through Congress is by a lot of these companies that are like GE and like a lot of these big time companies in the United States are pushing for this to go through the Congress so that they can have access to this technology. Right. And how he talks about how like he doesn't have high hopes that what is going to happen through Congress is going to actually lead to the American public being disclosed on a lot of this stuff. But what it will do... If it could open up the information to competing business interests yeah. to study the technology. So Im- imagine competing business interests getting a hold of this technology and going in different ways with a lot of this technology. And then you have the development of a lot of these technologies that will absolutely change the face of of energy or whatever it might be in the country. So... Um, it's so that's something to though, think about, man. though. That's something that, I know it's frustrating, but I, you got to think like this is the way they operate. I know it's just like at what point, like I I get new keeping nuclear technology secret. Like if every single person knew how to build one easily, yeah, like it could end the world. Yeah, but like not. I know everything has different applications, but like, like that's just the deal with technology, you know, like everything's a two edged sword, you know, like it's a whole thing. Like guns don't kill people. People kill people. Um, like it's, it's yes, you can use something for destructive purposes, but you can also use it to like help mankind into a new age of plenty, you know? Absolutely. And like, I think we've, I think we've run this well dry of fossil fuels and burning this stuff. Like it's mm -hmm. obvious that as a culture, as a human culture on this planet, as far as like 
the first and second world countries. Like we're like, we're looking to get out of this fossil fuel stuff and it's a trend going on. I mean, yeah. I mean, and if it's, and if I think for some of the like companies, it's about like slowing, tightening the production, you know, to boost the price of fossil fuels for the people who have it. Yeah. So that's why yeah. a lot of the oil companies aren't totally off board with the green right. energy stuff. As long as it's restricting the supply and not killing it, right, then right, you're actually right. like raising prices per right. gallon until the day that, but I mean, if we, I mean, a lot of these UFO technologies, if we're talking about things that can traverse realities and, whether it's physical or dimensional space, like that's got to have applications that could help people, you know, Living keep lights really on in their house for cheaper, like allow people to climb out of poverty, allow countries to develop industrially yeah. that haven't been able to. Yeah. Um, it would change the nature of the world. And if yeah. it was out there and the world was like sufficiently energy independent, then a lot of people's control New over the economy can start to collapse. And I think there's interests that don't want that. And I think that's part sure. of keeping this black. I think there's a lot of vested interest in, in a lot of these aspects of this, you know, story, I guess you would call it, but UFOs. I don't really buy the, the mass panic excuse. Oh, absolutely not. I just, you know, UFO culture is like science sci-fi. Like not a one person hasn't thought of the, idea of ufos yeah. and, and wondered what it would, would it be terribly like. shock most people if that was part i think of it would reality. shock a lot of people but i think at the same time people are resilient yeah the difference between like being sh i guess shock isn't the right word would it like end civilization's ability to move function, forward you know to continue to function would that revelation shatter our civilization i don't think so I don't think so. I think it has the potential to, you know, have more harm when everybody's just in the dark about it. Yeah, it's just like, on. what gives these black budget people, these government goons, the right, to, right to be the only ones who get to decide the fate of humanity in this endeavor? Like, you know, they're not elected. Right. At some point, maybe in the distant past, someone who was elected created their like organizations, but since then they've kept it off the books, yeah. out of scrutiny, and on a need to know basis. And I just zero oversight. You can't trust someone with that kind of power of yeah. like the knowledge of the nature of the universe and the mm -hmm. possibilities of technology. Like it's not right. We all should be involved. Yeah. In the reality of that, that needs to be that's opened a human, up. That's a human thing. That's not a. That's not a. That's something that can absolutely change the complete face of the planet. But I think it is changing. Like, I think what some people are realizing is that, regardless of what the whether the government opens up, it's possible to study UFOs in the private sector as civilians yeah. in an open way. Like, not everything can be controlled. Like, we have the internet. We have global communication technology. Yeah. Things are decentralization. In the right and once something comes out, it can't be put back in the bottle. So, yeah, exactly. Even though maybe they do have access to information and physical material, like, at some point, something's going to slip. At some point, someone is going to be able to prove something. Yep. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we have enough that you could for me it's considered proof that something's happening. It's not something is happening. That's absolutely and it's just what and when are we gonna find out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that excites me and pisses yeah. me off at the same time. Yeah. This Alrighty. topic is fascinating and we're gonna continue to go down these paths. Yeah, Appreciate y'all hanging uh, out. Heck of a fun night. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the topic's great, man. I know. This topic's great. We're going to continue this. I actually haven't read much Jacques Vallée, and I actually ordered some of his books that are coming in, so I'm excited to go I, I think directly maybe into we, it for myself. Yeah, maybe we do a book report on one of these, that, like, two. Oh, okay. Just, like, if we can. I don't know. I think it would be work a good with. idea. We don't necessarily fun. have to read giant excerpts, but we can yeah, no. 
do little paragraphs, summarize, Absolutely. talk about it. So, yeah, if you guys want to continue listening, um, find us on YouTube. Find us on YouTube, Rumble. Check out our socials on Facebook and TikTok, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, um, X. Yep. Uh, and check our website, dualitycheck.net. Send us an email. Get involved in the conversation. Host at dualitycheck.net. Yep. We'll be here. See y'all next time. Stay curious. Stay curious.